Being a scientist, I think I can say that scientists are often accused correctly of taking simple things and explaining them in very complicated ways. It's probably the epicenter of this, perhaps at MIT, where everyone, I realized, have come, come here, it speaks in code, numeric codes. You don't study uh, you don't study neuroscience, you don't study engineering, you take course nine, you take course six, you take it in building 43 and 46 and 9.02. Listening to some students, I'm not sure if I need a translator or a slide rule sometimes to figure out what they're talking about. And so I stand in awe of someone like Alan Alda who takes complicated things and explains them in simple ways that everyone can understand. And he, given the, given the state of science in the public eye in today's world, I think we need a hundred Alan Alders. And if, if he would agree, at the, after dinner tonight, I think maybe we'll do some skin scrapings and maybe have you cloned. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know Alan personally, so I don't know how he acquired this interest in science. I speculate it might have uh, developed when he played the classic character Hawkeye on the series MASH, which ran for 11 seasons. Uh, we all went through school uh, watching MASH rather than doing our homework. Uh, he, for 11 years, he hosted the award-winning PBS series Scientific American Frontiers, and in which he interviewed hundreds of scientists around the world. This year, he interviewed anthropologists, primatologists, and neuroscientists in the PBS miniseries, The Human Spark, which raised the question, what makes us human? And I should say, as part of that series, he, Alan did have his brain scanned in our imaging center downstairs in an interview with uh, Rebecca Sachs. On Broadway, he played the physicist Richard Feynman and had the weird experience of then giving the commencement address at, at Caltech where Feynman had himself given the commencement address in the past. In 2006, for his efforts to help broaden the public's understanding of science, he was presented with the National Science Board's Public Service Award. For the last two years, Alan has been working with physicist Brian Greene in presenting the World Science Festival in New York City, which was attended last year by 160,000 people. It is a privilege to welcome Alan to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have, no, I have my own personal microphone. Thank you. Uh, it comes in handy on the train, you know. I'd like a beer, please. Thank you very much. I, I, for anybody who knows what I actually look like ordinarily, I, I guess I should explain the hair in my face. Uh, I'm making a movie right now in Georgia where I have to be bearded and scruffy. I'm playing the, uh, the founder of a free love commune. And it's fun to, to play that. <laughs> the research is exhausting. <laughs> Killing me. Uh, I, a couple of days ago, I said to one of my daughters, I'm a, I'm a little nervous. I'm going to go up to Boston and speak. And, and, she, and I, it's, it's, I'm usually you know, not, not nervous like that. And she, and she said, well, well who, who are you talking to? And I said, a lot of neuroscientists. And she said, what are you going to talk about? And I said, neuroscience. <laughs> and there was this little pause. And then she said, don't they already know about that? I said, no, no, I'm not going to tell them anything. I'm going to ask them something. I'm going to ask them a question. And, uh, and I just want to make sure I frame the question right. You know, I mean, and, and this, is, this is the place to ask a question about neuroscience, of course. The, the, the McGovern, the neuroscience is, is probably the new frontier. 
and the McGovern Institute, the researchers here, are pioneers on that new frontier. And it's interesting, like Jane, I have a personal reason for wanting the McGovern Institute to be successful in, in the things it does, to understand the brain and then to do something about those people who suffer from brain problems. My, my, very, very close to me, uh, as it was with Jane, is the, is the question of um, mental illness. My, my mother was schizophrenic and paranoid, and I, my whole childhood was filled with um, an association with and a, a, a confront, confrontation with, with that kind of men mental illness. And then by the time she died, she died in um, some form of dementia. And I, I, I have this uh, personal hope that you'll be among the people who, who break down those, those walls of, of, of not understanding that kind of that kind of very painful life that is, of course, visited not only on the person who suffers, but on the family of the, of the person who suffers. And it can, that pain can be transmitted, the pain itself can be transmitted for, for sometimes generations. And, and, and as, as um, Bob said earlier, when he showed us the picture of the, the universe inside the brain, all of those billions of, of neurons in there. That you're able to make sense of that here is an extraordinary, an amazing thing. Einstein said words to the effect that the amazing thing about the universe is that we can understand it. Well, the amazing thing about the universe inside this three pounds of, of jello that we have is, is that it can understand its own universe. And, not all at once, not right away, not now, not yet, fully, but you people are taking us there. And it's, for people like, like Jane and I who have a personal stake in it, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. The brain is an amazing thing, and everybody, even before you began to understand the things about it you understand, everybody has always been fascinated with the brain. I don't know if you remember, those of you who are old enough to, rem to remember Raquel Welch when she was a great uh, sex symbol she said, because she had always, everybody had always talked to her and about her about sex, you know, so she turned the tables on them at one point and she said, you know, the most erogenous zone is the brain. And, and it's true. I, I know from a kind of personal experience with that. I was having my brain scanned um, once, and one of the first times it was scanned, and, the, and the, it was a kind of an attractive researcher. Um, <laughs> scanning my brain. And uh, I don't know if she could tell what I was thinking, but <laughs> when I came out, I came out from, from the tube, you know, and I came into the other room, and she was l intently looking at the screen at a picture of my brain, and she turned to me and she said, you have a plump hippocampus. <laughs> well, she got me right there, I'll tell you. And, and, and that was, I was being scanned as part of Scientific American Frontiers, which I did uh, uh, for 11 years so happily. Uh, um, and it was produced, much of it was produced by my friend Graham Chedd. And I have to correct Bob Desimone, who so generously said that I take complex things and make them simple. I don't. That's Graham Chedd's research and writing, so that when I would read the, the um, narrations, I was, I was talking as though I understood this so deeply. I have a general knowledge of, of some of these things because I, I'm very curious about science and I like to read about it all the time. That's all I read. But, but to be able to synthesize it like that was, was Graham Chedd's great ability. Now, I also have a great ability that I'll tell you about in a second. My great ability is to exercise my curiosity. I love to talk to scientists. And when Graham called me up and said, you want to do this show, I thought, I bet he only wants me to read the narration. And I said, I I'd love to do it if you'd let me talk to the scientists. Not just interview them, but talk to them. And we discovered, when he was brave enough to say yes, we discovered a new kind of science program. 
I don't think it had been done, if ever, not much, like this, where I just asked them questions, and eventually I understood that the more naive the questions were, the more I started at the bottom, what, are you, what, are you, what do you do? How do you do it? Well, what does that mean? I don't understand that phrase. And I would keep after them until they made it clear to me, to me personally, what they were saying. I never asked a question I knew the answer to. So I was always trying to understand them. And this amazing thing happened on their end. They came out. The real them came out. They weren't lecturing me. They were really connecting with me and trying to get me to understand this. And these conversational modes brought out not only their own personality, but brought out the science through their personality. So it, when I understood it, the audience had a chance to understand it. There was a kind of a television event that took place when I got it, you know. That was, it's a historic event when I get some of these things. So we went from that, we did, um, we did um, the, the human spark, and in each one of these situations, more, more and more we were talking about the brain. Many, many of our stories in Scientific American Frontiers centered on the brain. When we did The Human Spark, it was a three-hour uh, miniseries. We, we had to devote at least a third of it to the brain. And now, uh, Graham, Graham and I are going to be working on a, a miniseries called The uh, Brains, brains on Trial. And, and uh, uh, some of the advice we're getting is coming from the McGovern Institute. And, uh, and the Mike Gazaniga. Um, and what we're doing is tr tr exploring this new interface that's brought about between um, the justice system and what's now understood about the brain and what's continuing to be understood, and how do they fit together? Is that going to change anything about the way we think about justice or punishment or rehabilitation and that kind of thing? So this, this, con this constant... Um, movement toward more and more concentration on the brain is happening all over the world and, and it's reflected in the work we're doing. We, uh, Graham and I ha have gone around the world uh, talking to scientists, as, as Bob mentioned to you. Graham is a very kind, gentle person, but he's nearly killed me several times in, in doing this show. We were doing, we were, we're doing a, a story on Mount Vesuvius and he said, he said that we're just going to have to climb up to the top of uh, Mount Vesuvius and talk to the scientist up there. I said, I don't, I don't think we should climb to the top of Mount Vesuvius. He said, why? Oh, and he has this innocent tone of voice he uses. Oh, really? Why not? I said, because the story we're doing is how it could blow at any moment. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. There's a scientist up there. She has this monitoring equipment. There's no problem. She could, she'll tell us if there's a problem. So I climb all the way up to the top of Mount Vesuvius, and I sit down next to this big hole, you know, the, the crater, with, with steam jets coming up out of it, you know? And I'm sitting next to the scientists, and we're looking down into the crater, and I say, so, so tell me uh, about this monitoring, monitoring equipment. What do you learn from it? And she says, oh, not too much. He took me to Pisa on that same trip. We'd go to Pisa, and the guy who ran the, um, who was like the curator of the Tower of Pisa, is taking me through, and he had seen me on television, and, and he, was, he was very uh, uh, kind to me, and he was telling me all about the tower. He says, you know, this tower, it, it's leaning so badly that if it finally goes, it won't just fall over. It'll explode right in the middle because of all the pressure on it. And as we're talking, we're, we're, we walk over to the stairs and there's a sign there that says, no one permitted beyond this point. We're walking right past the sign. <laughs> I said, do you still let people up here? He said, oh, no, but in your case, we made an exception. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the one show we did where Graham made up for all of those dangerous things he put me through was when he actually saved my life. We were doing a program um, about astronomy and we were in an observatory in Chile about 8,000 feet up and I got this incredible cramp in my intestines and it turned out to be 
an obstructed intestine. We we're 8,000 feet up, and there was this, uh, this medic they had up there, and I don't think he'd ever been asked to do anything medical. <laughs> he, he, I was double over in pain lying on a couch. He said, uh, are you all right? I said, no, uh, I'm in a lot of pain here. He said, I said, it was over here, now I, the pain's down over here. I, I think maybe I have appendicitis. And he said, yeah, I think so too. So they happened to have an ambulance there. It was one of these old boxy things that looked like one of the ambulances we had on MASH. It was that old. They put me in it, and they took me down an hour and a half down this bumpy road and got me to a hospital where there was this wonderful surgeon in the middle of the night in this relatively small town called La Serena. And uh, he, he, he knew right away what it was. He had been trained in Japan and Santiago, and he, he was really really up to it, and he, 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 he leaned into me, and by now I'm like groggy on morphine, which was very nice. I had never had, I don't, I don't, I'd, I'd take aspirin at the most, you know. And, and, he, and so he leaned into me and he said, now here's what's happened. Some of your intestine has gone bad, and we have to cut out the bad part and sew the two good ends together. And I said, oh, you're gonna do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And he said, how do you know that? I said, oh, we did many of them on MASH. <laughs> and actually, that was the first, uh, the first operation I learned about on MASH was that. And, and he had been watching MASH as a student in school. So the two of us came to this evening from a fictional background. You know. <laughs> Anyway, he did the operation, and the way the story ended was I lived. <laughs> but one of the things that happened on that program, and right around that time, was that I interviewed somebody, and, and that, that, that conversation I had with her changed the course of my life to a great extent, and it led eventually to the question that I want to ask you tonight. So, here's what happened. I told you, we had this wonderful situation, this wonderful system we had arrived at where we would just have a conversation and the person would warm up to me, the scientist would warm up to me, and the science would come out in a conversational way that was understandable. And if it wasn't, I would just ask questions and it would become understandable. Well, she was fascinated, she was doing really good work and we had this really good conversation that was going back and forth, but I think something happened as she was talking, I think she remembered that what she was saying was a lot like a lecture she was used to giving. And little by little, she turned away from me and looked right into the camera and started giving her lecture into the camera. And almost immediately, she became unintelligible. <laughs> she started using words that I didn't never heard before. She started, her, her tone changed. It got more regimented. It, it didn't have that warmth of conversation. So, I, you know, I, I brought her back a little bit. I started asking her some more questions. I drew her back to me. She turned back to me. Oh, well, boom, she's a human again. Now she's talking. We're having, and then all of a sudden, she turned back again to the camera. And this went on three or four times. And, and I thought about this a lot after I, after I left. And I thought about all the times that I've heard lectures and they, they were a little stiff often. And I thought, what's the, what, what? not always, <laughs> certainly not this one. So I, I, I thought, what's the difference between that, that warmth, that presence, the connection with the people you're talking to? What's the difference between that and the other thing, the, the, cold, the cold version? And I remembered something that I had been through as a young actor, which was studying improvisation. And I remembered the striking result of that, 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 that I had become aware of, that most of the people who studied improvisation long enough became very charismatic, and many of them became stars uh, of entertainment that we all know. I mean, very often, you don't realize that they started as improvisers. You just think of them as actors on the screen. And I, I thought, because I had taught improvisation for a while after, after I studied it. And I thought, I wonder if that 
training could be helpful to scientists. And it was just a, an idea, just a, a thought. I, didn't know, I had no idea if it would work with scientists the way it can work with actors, if even scientists would be interested in exploring it. And the thing about improvisation is it's not just, in fact, it's not at all standing around making things up. That's not the center, central part of improvisation. The most important part of improvisation is making contact with the other actor. And I wondered if, if scientists could be trained to make contact with another person in these exercises and games that make up this particular kind of improvising that I was teaching, could they translate that to making contact with the audience? Because that's what's lacking is, that's what, we had, that's what I had with that, that scientist when she was talking to me was contact. And I lost it when she turned toward the camera. So how could I get that process to work for the scientist? So I decided to try an experiment. I asked, I was going to be interviewed or something at, at USC. And I said, while I'm there, would you get 20 engineering students to come in and, and give me an afternoon to play with me? and ask, have them be prepared to give a little talk about their work, just two minutes before we start. And that's what they did. And they were varying degrees of, of warm to cold. Uh, <laughs> mostly cool. They were doing, using PowerPoints, and, uh, and, they, and they were reading the PowerPoints to us, you know. Uh, but, then we played these games for three hours. These are, these are um, improvisational exercises invented by a woman called Viola Spolin about 60 years ago. And she's really, uh, she's gone now, but w while she was doing her work, she's, she, she changed um, acting in the country and possibly in the world. So we played these, they gave their talk, we played the game, the games for about three hours, and they gave their talks again, and there was a noticeable difference, and everybody in the room was surprised, including me, because I was just trying it out. So then, a couple of years later, I had been going around, I was desperate to try to find some way I could be helpful in getting scientists to communicate their science with more vividness and more clarity, most of all clarity, not to dumb down the science, but to be clear about it so that the rest of us feel that they're talking our language. So Stony Brook Univer University got interested in this and they started a center for communicating science and I've helped them get started. And I've taught a, a lot of workshops there to scientists to get them familiar with improvising to see if that would have an effect on how, how they speak to other people. I'm going to show you, I, I always discourage scientists from using PowerPoints, but I'm just going to show you a little bit of, of what, what came up. First, I'll show you, part of, part of this is, um, wait a minute, is this going to happen on the screen over here? Oh, there it is, yeah. Isn't that great? That's my first slide. <laughs> I made this myself. So, um, I, I'll, I'll give you a little flavor of what, of what the improvising games are like. And then at, at the end of that, you know, like they, they mirror each other. They get used to one another. They get used to observing one another and, and being in one another's space. They make things out of air so that they will allow themselves to get off themselves and, and into a common agreement with the other people about where they are, what they're working with. And then they, they mirror one another's bodies, and then they mirror one another's speech, sometimes talking both at the same time and to see if they can anticipate what the other person is saying and speak at exactly the same time. This takes them off of themselves, out of themselves, and puts them in contact with the other person. But when, when, after you see a couple of these games, you'll see the difference between the talks they gave before the games and the talks they gave after. We brought some scientists together for an experiment. We want to see if they can improve on the way they communicate science by playing improvisational theater games. The games are pretty rigorous and they take a while to learn. 
they also take a willingness to let yourself go in front of other people. This is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. kidding. <laughs> it makes the whole, whole science, science thing, thing look really, really easy. <laughs> in these brief workshops, the scientists first learn to be more aware of their own bodies and more observant of what others are doing. They mirror one another's movements. They create things out of imaginary space. And with a make-believe rope, they get into a real tug of war, all to prepare them for the games to come later. As antic as some of this is, our goal is not to dumb down the science. On the contrary, we're hoping these participants will find greater clarity in presenting science, clarity and a vividness that will make their presentation stick in a listener's head. So after a few hours of these games, was there, in fact, a noticeable difference in these scientists' presentations? Take a look at these clips that were shot before a workshop and then after. We shoot neutral atoms at a sample. The neutral atoms deposit their internal energy onto the sample, changing the sample and then allowing it again to be developed, much in the same way as photography. You expose film and then develop it. Neutral atoms have to be, well, they can't be controlled by electric fields because they're neutral, so they actually get controlled by light. No, Pretty uh, much, no, they don't, they, they're, they don't interact with a lot of things because they don't have a charge, and the biggest thing we have floating around is electric fields. It's electric fields are, again, this particle, field, wave particle duality. The, the wave part is typically an electric field, and so it's what we use to... Uh, run our radios, it's what, the, what current runs through the wall, and so these neutral atoms don't interact with the current in the wall. So it's really nice. You can have a very, very tight control over what they do because they don't interact with everything else that's going on. The one thing that they do interact with is a specific kind of light that's tuned exactly to the atom. And what's really elegant about this uh, neutral atom lithography is that instead of, so with photography and with photolithography, you're shooting light through matter to make a pattern. And here we're shooting matter through light and ultimately making a pattern. Anything that's in the soil, as it's filtering through, can get mobilized into the groundwater. Things like fertilizers or pesticides or leaky sewage pipes. Um, all of that gets into the groundwater and moves along down through the uh, aquifer the beaches I like to go to personally I don't like to swim in anything that I can't see the bottom of and part of that is you know part of what makes it difficult to see the bottom of the seafloor is the, all of the things that are growing that's not the end of it but it stopped okay okay so I I don't know if, if you see it but I, I see a, a, a real difference in there uh, energy in their presence, the ease, their, their mouths don't get dry uh, as much. They, uh, they're actually talking to somebody. And the interesting thing about this to me is, uh, just as Jerry was talking about mirror neurons, um, th there's, there seems to be an elevated ability to understand what the people they're talking to are thinking. You know, when, it was very touching when, when, when Jerry said, imagine what it's like. What, is it li what would it be like to, to live a life where you didn't know what other people were thinking? And what we heard over and over again when, when we talked to scientists about what is it that makes us human when we were doing the human spark, over and over we heard it's this in incredible ability humans have to socialize. And the, the theory of mind plays a big part in that, where we are looking all the time to find out what's going on in this other person's head, this person who we're talking to. Do they understand us? Are they honest? Can we trust them? What are they thinking? What do they think of the people that we're thinking about? What are they thinking about the people they're thinking about? All of this in a way, what's been described as reading of minds is going on. But it's all picking up cues and uh, processing those cues until we can make use of this connection. 
But the connection doesn't take place unless you can be tuned in to the people you're talking to. You can't get anything out of them. How can you actually talk to them? My question to these young scientists was, how can you tell them something if you don't know where they are while you're telling them? So just as you were aware of your partner on stage, where you could see where their arms were moving, you could read their thoughts as, as they were playing the game with you, if you can translate that to the audience, and when you tell them something, understand or imagine where they are in their minds at that point so that they're prepared for the next thing you tell them. And you're only going to get that if you look in their faces. Often, the, 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 these, these kids would tell me that in order not to be nervous, they'd look over their heads. And, and it's a common way to handle it. But you're not talking to the ceiling. You're talking to these people. And they're the ones you want to you connect with. Now, in the process of this, they, uh, they got much warmer. And I'm getting closer to the question now. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? So in the process of getting them warmer like this, getting them more spontaneous, I, I real, I, you know, all along I've, I've thought, uh, it's not just a question of getting scientists to present things in person in a, in a, in a more spontaneous way. I want, I want to see everybody's uh, um, ability to communicate in all the ways improve. The writing, you know, writing op-ed pieces, writing uh, uh, articles, that kind of thing. So I, I wondered if this improvising was helping them be more creative in their writing. So I said, instead of talking to us for two minutes about your work, just write a couple of paragraphs about your work, and we'll see if the writing has changed any. And so we'll, we'll all get you know, to share it, come up and, and read it to us. This was a very interesting experience. The writing had not improved uh, terribly much, but what was amazing was the spontaneity evaporated. And it evaporates when they read. This, it turns out, I believe, is true for everybody on the planet. Whenever you hear somebody reading, you get some typical characteristics. There's a cadence that's, that's typical of often lower, lower uh, reading in the lower grades, you know, like third grade reading. This, but this is true for most people, and sometimes it's even true for trained readers, people, people who read in public, sometimes uh, actors and, uh, and, and other people. They, they, the cadence, they go, the, 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 there's a sound to the, to the cadence. It goes, there's this downward inflection at the end of uh, sentences. They're not communicating with anybody. They're, they're processing words that are coming off the page, hitting the back of their brain, and going, so I don't know where they're going. That's part of the question. So they, they, they mispronounce words more frequently when they're reading. It's a, it's a mechanical process they're going through. It's not a communicative process. And I, I believe you can tell that just by listening to it. I, see if you can figure out what the difference is when I play you this little, this little um, audio thing. This is, a, this is from a, a video that was shown on public television uh, by the author of a very important book, and it's a very, very good documentary. He is interviewed at some point in the, in, the, in the film. And he's speaking spontaneously in, answer, in answering questions of the interviewer. In other parts of the film, he's narrating, which means he's reading what he's saying. Just listen and see if you can tell when he's speaking spontaneously and see if you can pick up the point where he starts to narrate. Well, there are two different issues. One is that it keeps happening again. And why doesn't anybody do anything to stop it from happening again? And it keeps happening because there are political regimes that find it useful to deal with their self-defined problems. And it's a very useful tool. They do it because they know they have basically impunity. And there has been very little calling to account. And they get away with it time and time again. So quite clearly, the status quo is catastrophic. And when I say catastrophic, I mean literally catastrophic because it takes the lives of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions upon millions of people. And so never again is a hollow phrase. It's well meant, 
But in the world of what actually happens, it's been a hollow phrase, a mockery of itself. What must it feel like for a 10-year-old boy to contemplate his own imminent, violent death? Or a 16-year-old girl? Or a 19-year-old man? What must it feel like to be imprisoned in a rape camp? Or to watch helplessly as members of your family are killed? Or as your people are decimated? You hear the difference, right? It's, it's an, to me, it's an amazing difference. The things he's saying when he's speaking spontaneously are less, by far, less horrendous than the things he's describing when he's reading. And yet, there's less life when he's reading. He's not, somehow not inspired by the very words and the lifetime he's put into studying this horrible problem of uh, genocide. He's not inspired by that. Now, this is no fault of his. This is a problem with the reading process that we have to find the solution to. Here's my question. We've, we've been told so many times about, as, as Jerry described earlier, the social networks in the brain, how they differentiate us from the other animals, how important they are for our survival as a species. Now, we've been doing that. We've been speaking spontaneously for a long time. I mean, how long? Probably more than 200,000 years, probably a lot longer than that. How long have we been reading? Less than 5,000 years. So my question is, these circuits in the brain that are devoted to socialization, to understanding, reading faces, understanding those faces, speaking in a tone of voice that carries emotion with it, that carries meaning above and beyond the very words themselves. To be able to interpret what we see of that in other people and hear in other people. That surely happens, I would think, during spontaneous speech. And when spontaneous speech occurs, I would think there's a lot that those circuits of the brain have to say before the motor cortex gets busy and the jaws and the tongue start producing words. That spontaneous speech seems to be intimately tied in with those circuits, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining from everything I've heard. My question is, are the circuits in the brain that are active in reading, are they bypassing or short-circuiting the social parts of the brain? the networks and maps that make up what makes us most human. And what's amazing to me is when we, when we talk in a way that just reflects words on a page, whether we've memorized them or we're actually reading them, we're giving up the very thing that makes us human. We're giving up that connection. And I want to see that connection reestablished. I'm hoping that eventually all the skills of communication will be part of every scientific education. And I'm hoping that the, the, the goals of this um, Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook will, will spread because we're, that's what we're trying to work on there. And I'm hoping that scientists all over our culture will be speaking in their own voices. Can you help me with that? If you have any ideas. Oh, that's what that, the slide was up. Wait a minute. Where, now I've lost it completely. Wait, oh, this is good. This is why I tell people not to do slideshows. Now I go, boom, 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 boom. There. Write me at brainspeech at gmail.com. Okay, if, anybody's, if anybody has pictures or some ideas about uh, those circuits that are devoted to spontaneous speech, which I think from the impression, the impression I get from reading is that there's been less attention paid to that than there is to the reading brain. There's a lot of work on that. So is, is, does anybody have any ideas about what's happening in the spontaneous uh, uh, 
speech part of the brain. And can, and because what we can do maybe is figure out how to make up uh, for the gap that's occurred, how we can bridge that gap. Can you help me? If you can, drop me a line. Thank you.